It was 2013, so it was the 100th anniversary of the work, and I was really interested in how, in the choreography, there's all this folkloric Russian dance that gets turned into, you know, this kind of modern dance material. And, um, and Stravinsky wrote music for it, and he was like, ah, oh, the dance is too anecdotal, it has too much, like, story in it, too much, too much related to people and myth and stuff, so I want to kind of leave it behind. So I was kind of digging into that, and then at the end of that evening of versions of The Rite of Spring, there was a performance of the Ballet Mechanique, which um, is, is very rarely performed live because it is a extremely complex piece of music to, to put together. It requires airplane propellers and sirens and like four player pianos and four xylophones and people kind of jumping around and pounding and like, you know, like the, you know, it's called Ballet Mechanique and there is no dance and there's never been a dance that goes with it, even though it's existed for 91 years. But there's a lot of motion and action inside of it. So when I watched it, I was like, wow, how could I begin to figure out how to turn that into a dance, a dance itself? And it's also kind of in this period of modernism where Stravinsky and, and you know, folk dance. So I was kind of, I'm going to keep going in that direction. So, um, yeah, so I guess, you know, sort of speaking generally about modernism, for those of you who know about it, I'm sorry to repeat things you know, but, um, you know, this period of the, you know, modernism started, I would say, you know, <laughs> you argue with me, but late, let's say late, age, late mm, 1700s in literature, as a literature movement, but um, in the early 20th century, it kind of took a turn because of the rise of industrialization and technology and that coming into, and a huge sort of mass exodus from country living into city spaces. Um, and so there are all these people, all these machines, the invention of the car, you know, the radio, like all these like ways in which information was being transmitted through people and things were speeding up. And so I've become really interested in this kind of myth of the speeding up of our lives that the 20th century has kind of passed on to us, <clears throat> which then kind of enables the sort of constant need to reinvent or invent more technologies to be more efficient uh, and more, you know, um, uh, yeah, more efficient, more productive, more precise, let's say, in our day-to-day -day activities. <laughs> Which is why dance as a form becomes interesting to me, because it's maybe one of the most inefficient things you can do. Or people say that it takes an hour to make a dance, to make one minute of dance. And, you know, for, you know, in terms of a, <laughs> I mean, it depends on he's frowning, because he's like, I can make a whole dance in an hour. Um, so I'm really interested in the value of something that can be measured, that the value of something that can be measured by these sort of like modes of production through machines that um, generally kind of dominate our, our existence today. Um, so, so modernism, as we've learned this turn in modernism that I've been thinking about this semester, um, specifically in Central Western Europe, um, <clears throat> You know, it can be sort of characterized as, as, a, as a kind of response to post World War One. This, this feeling of a fractured European consciousness, this feeling of kind of defeat and a kind of invasion, and a sort of being at war with your neighbors, and um, and um, and that some of the art of that. I mean, there also is not one modernism. Of course, there's many modernisms. There's a surrealism, and primitivism, and you know what I've been interested in this semester, which is more of the machinic. Modernism, the technological modernism. <clears throat> there are many modernisms, but they sort of generally, um, in a very general way, can be said to be organized around a kind of response of crisis. Either people are kind of embracing the changes in society and the kind of fracturing of, you know, conventional modes of being, or um, or they're or they're resisting it. Uh, so I'm just gonna. Um, um, kind of just talk through some of these notes that I've made on Valley on Mechanique over the semester. Um, I guess um, there's a there was I've been sort of reading up on this film, um, which has been which was made uh, as a collaboration between Fernand Leger, this uh, kind of post-cubist painter, and George Antile, an American composer who was living abroad in Paris at the time. Um, and so I've come across some, you know, interesting literature. So I'm just, uh, um, just going to kind of read from a, from an essay written about kind of an analysis of ballet mechanique and how avant-garde it was. Um, uh, so society. This is by Malcolm Turvey. Appeared in the October issue of uh, the magazine October in 2004. Um, 
that life, but really you can get the Swiss from me afterwards. Uh, society, it was argued by many avant-gardists of the period, was being fundamentally transformed by forces such as technology, industrialization, and, and urbanization, all of which were rapidly increasing the pace of everyday life for human beings, especially in urban environments. As a result of this increase, reality was no longer perceptually experienced by human beings as a smooth spatio-temporal continuum, according to many avant-gardists. Rather, it was now perceptually experienced as a dynamic, fragmented, unstable flux, susceptible to constant rupture, rupture and violent transition. Um, and so, and, and uh, you know, at the level of the body, I'm interested in this as maybe a myth, like maybe, because you know, you have, sure, we, you know, we're having a conversation and we get a text message and we are, you know, our, our focus is split, but then, on a day-to-day -day level, we live with our bodies, and you know, and, and the kind of sense of continuum or time and, and 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 aging and development and decay that happens in our bodies, I think, is something that fascinates me as a dancer. I think dancers and dance are particularly focused on mortality, actually, as a, as a kind of thing that is inescapable and a thing that you kind of explore, even as you explore the kind of wonderful sort of virtuosity or abilities of your body. Um, so, uh, so let me just give you a little history of ballet mechanique too. It was um, there was a young uh, American filmmaker in Paris uh, who had gone there to study to kind of get into the Paris salon scene. And uh, in his name was Dudley Murphy. And in 1923, he had saw a film by Man Ray, an experimental film. He proposed, "Hey, I've got all this skill and, um, and equipment. I'd love to make a film with you." And Man Ray said, "Sure, we can make a film, but um, it has to be Dadaist. It can't be a kind of narrative film because it's kind of at that time become a sort of mass entertainment." And you know, he was Man Ray was all about the surrealism and kind of resisting that that kind of. Um, I guess some homogenization of, of the cinematic form uh, for mass consumption. Um, and so the Man, Man Ray and Dudley Murphy started you know, walking around Paris and, and kind of putting kaleidoscopes over the, the lens of the camera and, and filming machines and body parts and people. And they filmed Man Ray's girlfriend, Kiki de Montparnasse, who was a famous performer in Paris at the time. Um, Dudley Murphy's wife, Catherine, appears at the beginning of the film, swinging out of swing in this very bucolic setting before the like, modernist explosion happens all over um, your perceptions. Um, so they, but they eventually ran out of money. Man, neither Man Ray nor Dudley Murphy had enough money to finish the film. And so Ezra Pound, who was kind of a big kind of talent scout at the time, um, uh, sort of like said, hey, you should work with Fernand Leger. He's had a lot of success with film, uh, with painting, and he'll have enough money to bring this, this project to, to fruition. And um, and so they, the thing is that they were sort of mostly finished with the project, and Fernand Leger kind of bankrolled it from there until the end. And what's interesting is that in the credits for the film, you just see a film by Fernand Leger. Um, and you know, he's he sort of famously egotistical. And uh, so, and, and, and the film is kind of credited to him and the music to George and Kyle. But I, mean, I think modernism is, is always connected to kind of autonomous statement, you know, by an artist. And I, I, I was interested in this moment where there are these two other people that are involved in this process but don't often get kind of the same sort of credit. Um, and, uh, you know, in general, in terms of modernism, thinking of, of it as a response to a sort of fracturing in society, um, I'm always interested in, like, why do we have to break away from our communities or people that we collaborate with um, in order to make a kind of autonomous artistic statement? Like, why do we have to leave people behind in order to kind of, um, in order to make our art. And uh, dance is a very social medium, which is another reason why I mentioned. And film is a very collaborative medium. So I'm interested in kind of making a group piece out of these studies that I've been working on. Um, so let's see here. Um, I think the, you know, so the film is it's, uh, 17 minutes long. And it makes all these kind of equivalencies between machines and bodies, body parts. It makes equivalencies between you know, circles and bottles and other sort of um, mass-produced objects. And it's, you know, the, the rhythm of the film is quite erratic. And you're sort of 
perception. I mean, maybe from today's perspective, from like a 21st century perspective, it might be moving kind of slowly, you know, but, uh, um, but that, that it was a real kind of like revolution in, in perceptual experience. Um, and so they start working on the film, and then Ezra Pounds um, chose, or sort of commissioned his friend George Gentile to write the music. And George was living in Shakespeare and Company bookshop uh, and, and had tea at 4 o'clock every afternoon and would have people come in. And so it was like Hemingway and all these big waves of the modern humanist scene were visiting him. And so Ezra Pound was one of these people. And he said, oh, I'm you should do it because you're doing very avant garde, you know, fancy stuff. George Antile grew up in Jersey, grew up with, you know, a, a, um, uh, a view of like smokestacks and factories. And so he kind of, he never had this particularly like, romantic musical opera. He was a fantastic pianist. Um, and the way, you know, he made his way to Europe following a woman who had left him to become a concert pianist. And he ended up, he really wanted to be a composer. He was in Berlin for a while. Bob Stravinsky, but who was hanging was kind of hiding out there after World War One, and then he eventually made his way to Paris. And kind of through his connections to Stravinsky got kind of wrapped up in the slum. Um, but uh, and so um uh and that composed a group of mechanistic or industrial sounding instruments, including these player pianos and bells and sirens. And he wrote a treatise about I might be kind of, kind of also a maniac, wrote a kind of fit of of, um, of kind of, you know, futuristic vision. He wrote, My ballet mechanique is a new fourth dimension of music. My ballet mechanique is the first piece of music that has been composed out of and for machines on Earth. My ballet mechanique is the first piece of music that has found the best forms and materials lying inert in a medium that, as a medium, is mathematically certain of becoming the greatest moving factor of the music of future generations. And it's true that the music has influenced people like John Cage, and you know, so there's this kind of lineage also that I'm interested in that he started, that now I've been sort of trying to kind of rework for myself. Um, but, you know, I've, I've been reading his autobiography, and he kind of makes very little mention of Phenomena J, and kind of, sort of in, his, in his letters and notes, he kind of doesn't talk about the collaboration as a big sort of thing for him, which is sort of interesting because, so, and, and what happened was the film was 17 minutes and the music he wrote was 34 minutes long because they really weren't talking to each other. And so they, they premiered for the last 91 years, more or less, as separate works of art. So part of the project has also been how do I bring both this vocal aspect, turning the, the music into a vocal singing project and the film into a physical project, into, the, into, into dance. Um, the singing aspect has been, is, is less developed now than the, the moving aspect, which is also quite fresh. As you can see, most of this is like text-based research I've been doing. Um, so you will, you know, so you're not going to hear any kind of crazy <laughs> big you know, sing like an airplane siren today. But I had another semester. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I have, you know, there's tons that I can answer more questions later, but I want to kind of get to showing you a bit of the film and, um, and then move on to some of the sort of byproducts and sort of further questions that I have um, moving forward with this project. And I'll also be back next fall semester, probably still thinking about this, but maybe doing some other things. Um, and I, you know, I have collaborated with uh, Christina Crosby in a kind of a conversational way this semester, talking about questions of embodiment, and um, I, you know, I'd be happy to um, speak to that if you prompt me after I'm done rambling. Okay, so um, without further ado, I'll show you a little clip of Valley Mechanique.
like the cow. Just so you know, that's code for website. And hey, in real life mixed media, it's an action! My name's Pasta, and this is Wendy and Peggy. Yes, I'm co-founder. Yes, I'm co-founder. Yes, yes. Thank you. Life reproductions on top of shit, always in the moment. Always, always, always. Right now. So cool. Never in the past. We show you your life or better. With edit. With edit. Because we know right now and we know how to make things happen right now. We basically practice all day long. It's exhausting. And you need to
Track one. Track one. The woman in white. This is a LibriVox. Track one. The woman in white. This is a LibriVox. Track one. The woman in white. This is a LibriVox. LibriVox.
how do you create a sense of rhythm both in time and in the body? Um, how do you connect two bodies doing very different things? Um, where there is no, obviously, no narrative, like we're kind of outside of these narrative forms of storytelling and dance telling, so what, you know, what, what can we do in order to create a kind of connection between two bodies? So basically what you'll see is a, a version, uh, maybe the first chunk of the score, and we can, I'll talk about how the score was made afterwards, if you I'm still thirsty. <laughs>
all we have today, folks. So thanks for coming. Feel free to leave or stay, ask questions, whatever. Thank you. Thank you to Mimi for coming on this. Um, but I also have to first ask questions. Uh, your mind. Well, do you see a literal uh, connection between what we have with the film, whether or not they can make the music in this ultimate piece um, that you're creating? Um, I don't know if I can um, I don't. Do I need this for a documentary or is it? It'll come through better from okay. the camera, but it's, okay. it's up to you. Um, I don't, no, ideally I want to remove the film and any instruments on stage and just have whatever timing, physicality, ideas, physicality come through the performer's life. This point, my like you know sort of romantic ideal is that no, that like it'll be that I would like you know dissolve the film into liveness. Um, but there certainly will be maybe some kind of writing or something that will contextualize the performance. But you know, not. I mean, I, there there has been like a little voice in the back of my head like maybe you should have something from the film in there. It's, you know, I don't know. We'll see. We only need these films. So, I mean, I think the title of the work would be Ballet Mechanique, so, and like oftentimes the title is that one hinge that a live performance has with the audience or that one connection, so hopefully it will send people in that direction. Like, have people responded to the rise of technology, like, let's say, in the last 20 years versus how they responded in the early 20th century? I, uh, I mean, most, I haven't done, like, that, really that part of the research yet, but I would say that um, a lot of the kind of talk about technology now is more about sort of, like, cognitive behavior or cognitive dissonance or sort of like memory retention, like it's mostly at the level of the mind that people talk about sort of like social media, like the kind of Ryan Jacquard sort of stuff in terms of social media um, and just sort of advertising yourself and being your own avatar, you know, and multitasking and things like this. Um, uh, but I feel like his work also really talks about the physicality, you know, these kind of like affects or like attitudes that like are weirdly like plastic, you know, that like are supposed to be personalized or markers of like, this is how I say this, you know, but it's re repeated and, and sometimes at such a hysterical level so many times that it like eva it's evacuated of a kind of personalized aspect. Um, but no, I mean, no, I haven't really. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, it's something I've never thought about. It just kind of occurred to me during the talk. Uh, ballet Academy doesn't uh, highlight the thing that I'm currently interested in, which is electricity. We had a conversation about this. And it seems to me that the big difference between Victorian 19th century sort of into 20th century life is that it really was a machine. Uh, machines that were driven by, largely by steam. And the turbine is the thing that really changes the game. So that we move from mechanical to electrical. So that so much of what we talk about now depends on those turbines. Yeah. And I'm just curious about whether or, or if that matters to you, because the ballet kind of need is a largely geometric uh, machine-like forms, as far as I can see. Yeah. Uh, and yet, your film had a lot of the uh, sort of sparky, mm -hmm. sparky, all of you, but electricity, 
I'm certainly interested. I mean, I think, yes, electricity. I think it's, you know, there's a lot of industrial forms and shapes and kind of steam, like objects and things produced by steam-based machinery, but film itself is an electronic, you know, is an electronic medium, so there's that kind of confluence there. Right. Um, so absolutely, I think the, the electricity um, of the film and, and the kind of um, the charge of moving from cut to cut or image to image, I think, is part of what can inform the performance, you know. And then I think also when thinking, I mean, this is like, who knows how far down the road, but like lighting, you know, like lighting effects and then and, and just like the air between two people who are dancing and kind of how you charge that, how you choreograph that relationship so that there's a kind of um, performer's electricity that we generate together. Uh, a question and a comment. Um, first, a uh, question is also was interested in the ideas of historical representation and historical inspirations. Uh, during the same time as Value Mechanic, in your, during your research, were you looking at uh, uh, simultaneous parts of the world where similar, uh, similar enterprises were being made in terms of film, dance, or music? Uh, no, I, well, I mean, I was, I was looking at, I was, there's one artist, uh, Kader Atia, who's an Algerian artist, um, who does a lot of work, uh, kind of photographic archival work of, um, of sculptures that were being imported from Africa at the time, of post-World War I and soldiers who had been injured during the war, and that there was this whole kind of rise in sort of this like medical industry around reconstructing the body. Um, so, and, and there he puts these images of African masks next to soldiers who have had reconstructive surgery. And, and I mean, I can show you some of those images are quite, we, we, looked, at, we looked at some of them kind of early on. Um, so I was looking more like, he, and he's a contemporary artist working now, kind of doing this group Revisionist projects. Um, I haven't. Uh, I mean, I've read about sort of modernisms and kind of innovations within traditional form that were concurrent, but not. I haven't focused on any as a comparison to Valley Mechanique, um, but I will. <laughs> the only reason why I ask the question because you take away the uh, Eurocentricism outside the word modernism. There are multiple uh, modernism, multiple cultures react to the word. Modernity very differently. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 so that was the sort of the. Uh, yeah. There's this like I was reading this kind of like um, to, you know, critical perspective on modernism, and there is this kind of um, in Arabic literature at the time, like there you know there innovations in terms of European modernism globally or generally speaking were more on form, you know, so kind of like looking at um, yeah, how do you contain an idea, and how does the you know the container become more interesting necessarily than the kind of sense of the communication, let's say. Um, whereas in Arabic literature at the time, it was really about the content and how images, you know, kind of appear in literature and are, are innovated, like based on like contemporary shifts and, and cultural values. But that's like super general. Don't look at that. And my comment was yeah. the, uh, your, your, your presentation and your film and the dance, it made me think about ideas of sort of the dayness of practice and the idea of repetition was so, such a, um, it, it, it took on so many more possibilities and it was so loaded. The idea of a cause and effect in terms of the magic, in terms of taking the human element out and what that does to the action itself. And the action itself becomes a kind of uh, uh, sort of a uh, primary color, you know, and that's, that came through in yours and also in the, in the dance itself. And in terms of uh, who was, in terms of the call and response, it was interesting when you sort of uh, called out the change. It was a kind of a hypnotic feel to it. In terms of, yeah, so I just wanted to express that. Um, yeah. I mean, I was calling the changes because there's no. Well, it was functional, but it also had an aesthetic ramification for yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I think that, you know, in terms of, it's like I want to kind of toe that line of like removing the human, but actually what becomes more and more evident ideally in that sort of mechanizing our relationship is the human that seeps out, or is the kind of inability to be fully robot-like, you know, that we're, we're thinking, we're making decisions, and the ways in which 
you know, humanity or interpersonality is communicated is, can be not necessarily through like drama or story, but through like timing or the gaze or the mutual focus on a thing or things like this, other ways in which are, you know, I think that's what value might mean is how do you relocate or rethink how your humanity is located, you know, or can be distributed in time. Another thing is mechanic of any relationship to what one of the comments and what the other what the other spectrum, what what the other story mm -hmm. of that to sort of become uh, engaged and activated. So it's a set of things but all those ideas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I saw um, even in this early stage such an evolution and just part of the dance that we saw from from the embodiment of the more mechanical, but perhaps it was knowing that you were both researchers together, that I saw that there became a very compelling intention between the two of you of research and experimentation of of not only doing the gesture but thinking about it and, and what does this feel like. And so exactly what you just said about humanizing. I thought was really fascinating. And I'm just also really fascinated about the dynamic between an experienced dancer and a less than experienced dancer, but you were so comfortable, you were so, your attention never wavered. And that was really, it was at a very high level, and I wanted to commend you for that uh, in a big way. Really yeah. Fascinating yeah. to watch. And just this idea of how exciting research can be. You know, I got that sense of interest and excitement. It's wonderful to see. Yeah. Can I just understand that? Really? Yeah. Is any, it was the idea of uh, keeping up anymore. It was this kind of communal That's quest right. to search together. That came through. Yeah. So, yeah. No, it's funny because we're like, what are we showing today? What is this <laughs> thing? Yeah, it has all this chatter around it that I keep talking about. Maybe it's like, I'm bored of that. <laughs> no, I mean, not at all. But, like, I, but it's great to know that that research and that time spent researching actually becomes a performative quality, you know? And, you know. and I mean, I'm really curious about you. Can you just talk about where you are in your time at West and what your major is? Just what do you bring to this? I, uh, I know about Will, but I don't know much about you. Um, I'm actually a computer science and Italian science major. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be declaring next semester, but that's pretty much the big picture. Um, I do have experience dancing. I've been dancing for a while, um, but nothing close to uh, this kind of dancing, mostly just ballet. <laughs> have you taken dance classes at West Um I'm taking ballet two right now, but that's my first class. Hope you'll take one. <laughs> so you're a sophomore if you're declaring a major in ballet? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. Great.